angels watching on our radio. And I'm glad today that you have uh, seen it best also to join us, even as we share the everlasting gospel. Today we are going to see a glimpse of these times, that is uh, a differentiation between the ceremonial laws and uh, the moral uh, law of God, so that we can get to a differentiate between the laws which are uh, our pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ and also the laws which have been fixed in the heavenly sanctuary. So today I'm glad to be with you and I'm going to have a, a study with you even as we we start we will start by a prayer. Let's pray. Our Father at heaven, thank you for this hour, thank you for this day. Be honored, be glorified, give us thy spirit, Lord. Teach us, teach me, teach uh, your people all over the world. Prepare us for the second coming. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, Father, Lord, we pray that you give us thy spirit. I pray and I believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, friends, today we are going to study about the two laws, and uh, it's a quote by Elder J. N. Andrews, whereby we get to understand today the message which will assist us in growing. The two laws. There is but one God, the Father of whom all are of whom are all things. First Corinthians chapter eight verse six. From him all things derive their existence. He who creates and upholds has certainly the right to govern and control. And see it is that he is represented in the scriptures as the one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. James chapter four verse twelve. Existence being derived from benevolence of the Creator, all intelligent creatures are amenable to its just government. Of all the creatures made by God to inhabit the earth, man alone is capable of learning and distinction of right and wrong, and he alone is placed under the control of moral law. So, deriving his existence from a being of infinite purity, Man was himself once innocent, pure, and upright. He was the creature and the loyal subject of God. And God was the author of his existence and his rightful sovereign. But God did not, but God did uh, not anything towards man, the position of savior and redeemer. For man needed not pardon. As a creature owing all to God, the author of his existence, it is self evident that he was under the highest obligation to love him with all his heart. The existence of other human beings originates uh, a second great obligation, that is to say, love our neighbors as ourselves. This precept is also one of self evident obligation, for others uh, are equally the creatures of God with ourselves ourselves and have the same right that we also have these two precepts are the sum of oral or moral law and they grow out of the fact that we always owe all to god and that others are the creatures of god as well as ourselves in rendering obedience to the uh, first of these two precepts man uh, could have no other God before the Lord, nor could he worship idols, neither could he speak the name of God in any irrelevant manner, nor could he neglect the allowed rest day of the Lord, which was set as a part at creation in the memory of uh, the Creator's rest. Equally evident uh, is it that uh, our duty towards our fellow men comprehends our duty to our parents and the strictest regard to the life, chastity, property, character, and interests of others. The moral law thus derived into two parts and drawn out and expressed in ten precepts is of necessity and changeable in its character. Its existence grows out of immutable relations which man sustains towards God and towards uh, is fair of man. It is God's great standard of right, and after man is repairing, the great test by which sin is shown. Where shall we look for the record of such a moral code as we have noticed? 
in the earliest possible place in the Bible, certainly, and yet the book of Genesis contains no moral code uh, whatsoever. How can this mystery be explained them? A few facts will remove the difficulty. Remember, George chapter 40 verses 8, it described for us that in these last days there is something which is to happen. As what was happening in the time of Job, it will come again. And it will test if indeed we will obey the voice of God or we will obey men. Or, like the wife of Job was saying, cast God and die, those tests will also come to us in these last days. In Job chapter 40 verse 8, the question is uh, asked, Will thou also disannul my judgment? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Will we break the commandments of God so that we can uh, condemn him? Will we disregard them? The book of uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 it spoke that there is a man who was to come and speak great words against the most high. He was try to try to listen to the judgments. So the account of Job will repeat in these last days, calamities, destructions by fire and the sea, all calamities. And what is the agenda? To dishonor the commandments of God and to approve the traditions like Sunday observance, which is uh, anti-biblical, actually it's not in the scripture. And uh, they would think to change, the purpose would think to change times and laws, which we have covered before. And uh, Psalm 24 verse 21, the Lord is saying, my son, that is Israel is my son, Israel, fear thou the Lord and the king. And made a note with them that are given to change. So there is those who are taught to change times and laws. As the book of Isaiah 24 says that the world is going through and the floor is drunk. It's falling. Why? They have changed the everlasting covenant. What is that? Job 17.22. They change the night into day. The light is short because of darkness. So they have tried to change. So what we want to know what have they changed. That's what we are going to see. They have changed uh, even the moral law. What actually was annulled on the cross is the ceremonial law. And that's what we are going to see. Job chapter 4 verse 7. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore would I change their glory into shame. So we, lo we lost the glory which we had in the Garden of Eden because we are ever repairing. Uh, we are ever, we are carnal, we are ever repairing against the laws of God. The book of Genesis was not written until 2500 years after the creation. As it was written long after the patriarchs were dead, it could not have been a rule of life for them. It is a brief record of events that occurred during, the, that, during that period and contains several allusions to an existing moral code. But the book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, which brings the narrative down to the author's own time, that's Moses, includes this code under circumstances of greatest solemnity. Where God wanted them to remember these words. In this book of uh, Exodus is found the law of God as given by himself in person and written with his own finger and stone. Indeed, the evidence indicates that no part of the Bible was written until after the Ten Commandments had been spoken and written by uh, by God and consequently that that God is the earliest uh, writing in existence. Such was the origin of the moral law and as such the character of its precepts. It is proclamation by God himself prior to his causing any part of the Bible to be written sufficiently attest the estimate which he placed upon it. So, from its very nature, it exists as a uh, area as the principles of morality uh, are. Indeed, it is nothing but those principles expressed or written out. So, those principles is what the Bible entails, the Ten Commandments. These principles do not owe their existence to the fall of man, but to relations which existed prior to the fall. But there is a system of laws that does not owe it, owe it its origin or existence to sin. Uh, there is a system of laws that does, does owe it its origin to sin. A system that could have had no existence had not man been a transgressor or a, a, a repairer. Uh, are repaired. So these laws came after repairion. So those were pointing to something. The variation of moral law was that which gave e existence to the law of rites and ceremonies. So the shadow of good things to come. There could be no sacrifices for sin until man became a sinner. In Eden, there could be no types and shadows pointing forward to future redemption through uh, the death of uh, Christ. For man, in his uprightness, needed 
no such redemption. So in John chapter 4 verse 8, the question was asked, Will thou also disannul my judgments? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? So Job is the earliest known book uh, written, uh, as it is recorded even before uh, Genesis was written. It was written by Moses, as it is said. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14 verse 26, So in these last days, the Lord God of heaven is testing humanity, if they will obey, as in Arifa, he is also testing them in these last days. Isaiah 14 verse 26. Remember Isaiah 14 verse 13 he says, How art thou fallen from heaven? What is this fault? It's a falling away fast of churches, a falling away fast of nations and the people because they will not listen to the voice of God. And this is the test in these last days. Will men uh, listen to the voice of God or will they listen uh, to men man made traditions like Sunday laws? Uh, uh, homosexuality, LGBTQ+, plus, and all those doctrines which are fighting the principles of God. So Isaiah 14, 26, this is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole old, old art. The, what is this test coming to the old art, which is drunk with the doctrines of Rome, this apostate woman, Arab woman, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. So God has allowed strong del delusions. Those who will believe should believe, and those who will not believe, they shall believe strong delusions and the lies. Then seven, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? What is this that he has stretched out? What is this that he has purposed? Will we obey his voice, the Alpha test and the Omega test? In the year that King Ahaz died was this pardon. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show you in the year that uh, King Ahab died also, there is something which came. There was a test of uh, when that king of uh, Samaria was sick. A test came where would he seek help from? He was sick. We have had a disease in the world, a pestilence 19. Where did the people get help from? That is a great test as it is for us today. The test is, remember we have put this the temple of God where God will make his covenant. He will establish is everlasting covenant for god has put in their us to fulfill his will and to agree and to give the kingdom unto of the peace until the words of god shall be fulfilled so there is a journey here as another journey a challenge and task for american seminary what is this journey challenge a sabbath for the earth and the poor the challenge of Pope francis who is this that is trying to come up with his own sabbath this is the one we read in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. He shall think to change times and laws. But God has not changed. Made out not to them who are given to change. Nor did God place upon man before his fault the obligation of carnal ordinances, which look forward to the time of reformation. Man was innocent and free from guile. That it was the... So in the book of Revelation, we find virgins who are... No, their mouth are free from guile. So who are these? They have kept the commandments of God. That it was the violation of moral law that caused the fall of man may, may be seen at a glance. But also in the last days, it is the obedience of the moral law uh, which will make man to rise and uh, to the character of God. The motive set before Eve by Satan was that they should become as gods if they ate of that tree. If they disobey, they would be as God. Does God like disobedience? No. Genesis 3.3. 3. Genesis 3. And as Adam was not deceived, as First Peter chapter 2, 13 says, it is evident that he chose to follow his wife rather than to obey the Lord. So even in these last days, men will choose to follow the church. Wife is a pride. To follow the church rather than following the voice of God. Many have, have, they have their ears steered with iron. So an open variation of the first commandment in each case, huh? When man had thus become a sinner, and God had promised the means of his redemption, a second relation towards God was brought into existence. What is that? Man was a sinner needing forgiveness, and God was a savior offering pardon. So he sent his son, his begotten son. It is plain, therefore, that the typical law pointing forward to redemption through Christ, or it is origin to man's uh, rebellion. So some laws were brought for our own good uh, to save man, man who had gone very far. So some laws had come to for saving humanity. It's plain therefore that the typical law pointing forward to redemption through Christ, or it is uh, the typical law uh, pointing forward to the redemption 
through Christ or it is origin to man's rebellion and to God's infinite benevolence. If man had not sinned, he would have needed no types of future redemption. And if God had not determined to give his son to die, he would have instituted no typical system pointing forward to that great event. Powerful words. The existence of such a God, therefore, is in consequence of sin. It is it is presence are of a ceremonial nature, and its duration is necessarily limited by the great offering that could take away sin. From the fall of Adam till the time of Moses, the typical system was gradually developed and matured, and from Moses Moses' time until the death of our Lord, it exists existed as the shadow of good things to come. So at Mount Sinai, as we have seen, God proclaimed the moral law, speaking it with his own voice and writing it with his own finger. By his direction, the two tables on which the law was written were placed in the Ark of the Covenant, which was made on purpose to receive it. Uh -huh. uh, Exodus chapter 25 verse 30, uh, Exodus chapter 25 verses 10 to 22, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 1 to 5. So at this Ark, and this ark containing the law of God was placed in the second apartment of the Atri sanctuary, the most holy place, Exodus chapter 40 and uh, Hebrews chapter 9. So the top of the ark was called the mercy seat, because the man who had broken the law contained in the ark beneath the mercy seat could find the pardon by the sprinkling of the blood of atonement upon this place. So the top of the ark was called the mercy seat. Uh, because that man who had broken the law contained in the ark before the mercy seat could find pardon by the sprinkling of the blood of atonement upon this place. So we should be sprinkled with this blood, uh, blood of Jesus, which saves us, it has saved us. So the old system of ceremonial law was ordained to enable, remember we are at the temple of God, the old system of ceremonial law was ordained to enable man to approach again to this broken law and to typify the restitution of the pardon to their inheritance and the destruction of the impenitent. The law within the ark was that which demanded an atonement, the atonement, atonement, the uh, ceremonial law which ordained the Levitical priesthood and the sacrifices for sin was that which taught men how the atonement could be made. The manner it could be made. The broken law was beneath the mercy seat. The blood of sin offering was sprinkled upon it to stop, and the pardon was extended to the penitent sinner. The, the pardon was extended to the penitent sinner. There was actual sin, and hence a real law which man had broken. But there was not a real atonement, and hence the need of the great antitype of the Levitical sacrifices. The real atonement, when it is made must relate to the law respecting which an atonement had been shadowed forth. In other words, the shadowy atonement related to that law which was shut up in the ark, indicating that a real atonement was demanded by the law. It is necessary that the law which demands atonement in order that it is transgressor may be spared, should itself be perfect, else the force could be in at least uh, rest on the lawgiver and not holy with the sinner. Hence, the atonement, uh, when made, does not take away the broken law, for that is perfect, but is expressly designed to take away the guilt of the transgressor. So, in the New Testament, uh, we find the great antitype of all offerings and sacrifices. The real atonement as contrasted with the Levitical one, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ as the great sacrifice for sin was the antitype of all the Levitical sacrifices. So the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary is the great antitype of the Levitical priesthood, Hebrews chapter 8. The priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary is the antitype of the Levitical priesthood. Um, so we have the real atonement, which is also contrasted with the Levitical one. The Levitical one was pointing to what Jesus Christ was to offer for us. The real atonement is in heaven where Jesus Christ is uh, pleading for us in heaven uh, uh, to save us. He's our, uh, our what? Our high priest uh, in the order of Mary Shedek. The heavenly sanctuary itself is the great origi original after which the R31 was patterned. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 23. Exodus chapter 25, verse 6 and 9. And the ark of God is testament in the temple in heaven, 
Revelation 11 verse 19 contains the great origin of this law. And thus, we see under the new dispensation a real atonement. Instead of a shadow one, a high priest who needs not to offer for himself a sacrifice which can avail before God. And that law, which was broken by man, magnified and made honorable at the same time that God pardons the penitent sinner. In Job chapter 40 verse 8 we continue, uh, it was asking, Will thou so in sanal my judgment? Will thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? So will the laws of God be disannulled? No, the Ten Commandments can never be disannulled. Because they are the same laws which brought the ceremonial laws or the rites which were to point to the coming of Jesus Christ. And those are the same which brought those ceremonial laws to welcome Jesus to point to Jesus who was to come to save the world and to direct us as he says keep my commandments as I have kept them. Galatians chapter 3 17 and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ the law which was 430 years after cannot be disannulled, cannot be disannulled that it should make the promise of none effect. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 6 uh, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, what is this testimony? So that you come behind in no gift. You come behind in no gift. You don't come up with, with any gift now. You approach Jesus Christ who is what? A gift given from heaven. Waiting for the coming of Lord Jesus Christ. Now we take our sins to Jesus. We take our sins to Jesus. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Psalms 105 verse 10. And I confirm the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Remember Israel I confirmed it for Jacob, the house of Israel, eh? an everlasting covenant which shall never be broken. We shall find it, uh, the New Testament to abound with reference to the essential difference between these two courts. And that the distinction in the New Testament is made as clear and obvious as it is made by the facts already not seen in the Old Testament. Thus, the one court is termed the law of a carnal commandments, as Hebrews 7 and 16 says, and after other it is affirmed, we know that the law is spiritual. Romans chapter 7 verse 14. The one court is termed the handwritings, the handwriting of ordinances, which was contrary to us, and which was nailed to the cross and taken out of the way. Colossians 2 verse 14. The other code is the royal law, which James affirms that it is a sin to transgress. Chapter 2 verse 8 to 12. The first code is a code of which there was made of necessity a change. Hebrews 7 verse 12. The second is that the law of which Christ says, uh, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law, till or be fulfilled. Matthew chapter 5 verses 18. The one law was a shadow of good things to come, Hebrews 10 verse 1, and was only reimbursed until the time of reformation, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 10. But the other was a moral code of which it was said by John, whoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. One is a shadow of good things to come until the time of reformation. And another one is saying you should not translate to so commit a sin, translate as also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. First John chapter 3 verse 4. So the one is a yoke not able to be born. Acts chapter 15 verse 10. And the other is that law of liberty by which we shall be judged. James chapter 2 verse 8 to 12. The one is that law which Christ apportioned in his flesh. Evasion chapter 2 verse 15. The other is that law which he did not come to destroy. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. The one is that law which he took out of the way at his death. Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. The other is that law which he came to magnify and make honorable. Isaiah 42 verse 21. The one was a law which was disannulled for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 18. The other is a law respect, respecting which he requires. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yeah, we establish the law. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. The one is that law which was the middle war of partition between Jews and Gentiles. Ephesians 2 verse 14. The other is that law, the work of which even the Gentiles are able to have written in their hearts. Romans 2 verse 12 to 15. And to which all mankind are amenable. Romans chapter 8 verse 19. The one is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Version 2 verse 15. The other law is the commandments of God which 
is in the old duty of man to keep. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. Which are brought to view by the third angel. Revelation 14 12. Which the remnant of the seed of the woman were keeping when the dragon made go upon them. Revelation 12 verse 17. And which will ensure to those who observe them access to the tree of life. Revelation 22 verse 14. Surely these two courses should not be confounded. The one was magnified, made honorable, established, and is holy, just, spiritual, good, royal. And the other was carnal, shadow, shadowy, uh, pardonsome, and was abolished, broken down, taken out of the way, near to the cross, changed, and disannulled on account of the weakness and unprofitableness um, thereof. So those who rightly divide the word of truth would never confound these, uh, uh, confound these essentially different courts. Nor would they apply to God's royal law the language employed respecting the handwriting of ordinances. That the Ten Commandments are a perfect code of themselves appears from several facts here below. Let's see. Let's see. One, God spake them with his own voice, and it is said he added no more. Deuteronomy 5 verse 22 as envisioning that he had given a complete code. Number two, he wrote them alone on two tables with his own finger. Another incident, incidental proof that this was a complete moral, uh, moral code. Number three, he caused this alone to be placed under the mass seat. An evident proof that this was the code that made an atonement necessary. He expressly called calls what he thus wrote on the tape of stone a law and a commandments. Exodus chapter 24 verse 12. So the precepts of this law are uh, precepts of this law are variously interpassed uh, through the books of Moses and mingled with the precepts of the ceremonial law. And the sum of the first table is given in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 and that of the second in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. But there is only one place in which the moral law is drawn out in particulars and given by itself with no ceremonial law mixed with it, and that is in the Ten Commandments. The moral law is drawn out in particulars and given by itself with no ceremonial law mixed with it, and that is in the Ten Commandments. So an examination of the royal law in James chapter 2 verse 2 and of the handwriting of ordinances in Colossians chapter 2 we further illustrate this subject. The one is seen in force in every respect, while the other is abolished. If you fear the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law, uh, of law as transgressors, convinced of the law as transgressors, for whosoever shall keep the old law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. James 2, verse 8 to 12. Number 1. The law here brought to view is an, 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 uh, an apology law, for it convinces men of sin who transgress it. Number 2. It is an old law, it is taken from the scriptures. Number three, the second division of law is quoted because it was re reproving sin committed towards our fellow men. And hence, he, he takes the second of the two uh, great commandments, the sum of the second table. Matthew 23, verse 36, to 40, uh, 36 and 40, Romans 13, verse 9, and the sites is illustration from the second table of uh, stone. Uh... So that is it. One part is saying do not kill. Mm, love your neighbors who love yourself. Do not commit sin. Uh, commit law. A transgressors. Okay. That one we have covered. Huh? You, as you can see. The second division of the law is quoted because it was reproving sin committed to us our fellow men. And hence it takes the second of the two great commandments. The sum of the second table. His language shows that the Ten Commandments are the presence of the royal law, for he cites them in illustrating the statement that he who violates one precept becomes guilty of all. This is a most solemn warning against the violation of any of the Ten Commandments, friends. Number five, he testified that whoever violates one of the precepts of this court becomes guilty of breaking the 
whole code. And last of all, he testifies that this law of liberty shall be the rule of rule in the judgment. The unapproached law of James is therefore that code which God gave in uh, in person and wrote with his own finger, plotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nearing it to the his cross. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any old day or of the new moon or of, of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14, 16, 17. If this handwriting of ordinances is the same as the royal law of James, then Paul and James directly contradict each other. But they wrote by inspiration and each wrote the truth of God. We have seen that James and Apollos' law refer directly to the Ten Commandments. Hence, it is certain that the law which Paul shows to be Apollos does not refer to that which was written with the finger of God. It is to be noticed that the code which is done away was a shadow extending only to the death of Christ. But we have also seen that the law shut up in the ark was not a shadow, but the very God that made it necessary that the Savior should die. Not one of the things apportioned in the chap this chapter can be claimed as referred to the Ten Commandments, except the term Sabbaths. For the term all day is literally feast day. And there were three feasts appointed by God in each year. Exodus 23 verse 14. The term Sabbath is plural in original. To refer this to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment is to make Paul contradict James. What are the facts in the case? Number one, the ceremonial law did, did ordain at least four annual Sabbaths. That is the first, the tenth, the sixteenth, and twenty-third days of the seventh month. These were besides the Sabbaths of the Lord and were associated with the new moons and feast days. Leviticus 23, 23 to 39. This exactly exact assures Paul's language. And see, it is not necessary to make Paul contradict James. But the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord was set apart to a whole use, this being the literal meaning of the of sanctify. But the Sabbath of the Lord was set apart to a whole use, this being the retro meaning of sanctify in Eden. It was made for man before he had fallen. Hence, it is not one of the things against him and are contrary to him, taken out of the way at Christ's death. It was not a shadow pointing forward to the death of Christ, for it was ordained before the fall. On the contrary, it stands as a memorial pointing back to creation and not a shadow pointing forward to redemption. Clear? It is plain, therefore, that the uh, abrogation of the handwriting of ordinances lives in full force ever presence of the royal law, and also that the law of shadows pointing forward to the death of Christ must expire when that event should occur. But the moral law was that which caused the Savior to lay down his life for us, and this sacredness may be judged of off by the fact that God gave his only son to take his curse upon himself and to die for our transgressions. Friends, are you in rebellion against the love of God? If so, I beseech you to lay down your arms and seek pardon in the blood of Jesus before the curse of law falls upon you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for choosing to be with Adventist Angels Watchman Radio. And this marks the end of uh, our broadcast today. Find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube and so much more Pal city and so much more platforms may god be with you may god give you peace which surpasses understanding let's pray father in heaven thank you because you have spoken thank you for your mercies bless us and continue leading us father save us we pray in the mighty name of jesus christ i pray and I believe amen thank you so much friends for juicing to pick the adventist angels watchman radio my name is evangelist king osiema goodbye